Eileen, it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. My great pleasure. Now, I know it's very early in the morning for you and it's the end of my day. And yet you look you look full of energy and joy. And I think it just oozes out of you. Well, you know, I, I did this little tiny um, video that I started off. I was asked to do it. And I started off by singing, well, I woke up this morning. You were on my mind. And then I said, actually, that is why I'm joyful. I did wake up this morning. It means I have another day. Oh, that's lovely. So how do I make the most of this day? That's lovely. That's lovely. And I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be part of it. And I want to talk to you about your main topic. In the introduction, I said that you've been talking about this and passionate about understanding this topic for, for a long time. And a lot of people are talking about it. And we'll go into that more as well later. But, but what is your definition of resilience? First off, I disagree with the dictionary definition. So I think you got to throw it out because the dictionary definition, if you look at it, it basically says that an object under stress can bend and then it resumes its original position. Or as people will tell me, it means bounce back. Human systems do not bounce back. You cannot enter the same river twice. So to me, the definition of resiliency is to grow through challenge or opportunity so you end up wiser smarter better kinder on the other side so it's all about growth and it is ultimately about energy management so i see resilience as being a life school skill it's not something that you say oh crap it's a pandemic and now i need to get resilient it's that we need it all the time and i also use the word cultivate so if you think of cultivating a field, you have to till the soil, you have to fertilize, you have to seed, you feed, you weed, and that's the same thing with resilience. And some days will be better than others at this. So, so that's, that's a long about way of giving you a definition, but I think it's what we need for the human system. I love the fact that you define it that we come out as better and kinder at the end of it. Right? And so you, you're not, as you say, not bouncing back to where you were. We don't bounce back, but we grow. Uh, and I also like the fact that you're saying, you know, it's not something you need just in times like these. I mean, not hopefully we won't have another pandemic in our lifetime, hopefully never again, but that you need to develop it all the time. It's there. It's yeah. that's, that's great. I like that. But you also talk about, and I, let's see if I pronounce this right, presilience. Oh, resilience. Well, I can think of it as preemptive resilience. So that's part of the notion that it is a life skill. So that if I'm practicing it, um, when in fact some event happens, like what the world is going through right now, I don't have to suddenly say, oh my gosh, what do I do? I begin to use some of the, the skills I've been, slowly, I've been slowly developing. It's kind of like, um, think of it as a booster shot. So when you give a child a booster shot, what it does, uh, it, it's, it's a preemptive thing and it takes the antibodies and it spikes them, it makes them better. So to me, presilience is like a booster shot that I keep working at it and working at it to make what's there better. And it is something that can be learned. That's the other thing my research has showed me um, is that um, it can be taught. Mm. And we practice it just like you would practice the piano. Um, but so you have to do it very consciously. So I, I find that a very hopeful too. But we can get, particularly given the times now, it's so easy to get sucked down into this morass of, of darkness and depression and despair. You know, absolutely right. I'm glad it can be taught. Um, I'm a very bad pianist, but anyway, <laughs> we won't go into that. I did try. I tried, but I, I didn't practice every day. You're absolutely right. And that's the thing you've got to practice. But you also talk about there being four skills that make up yes. resilience. Can you share those with us? Absolutely. And by the way, let me say thank you for being a great interviewer because you actually looked at the work that I do. I can't tell you the people who go to interview me who really have no clue. They haven't done their homework. So let me say to you, Maria, thank you for doing your homework, which also says to me that the people that you put within your organization and the people that you represent, you know who they are. So let me say thank you. All right, here are the four skills. The first one is adaptability. 
this is probably the big, big, big one. And people say, yeah, I know, I, ha I have to have another way of doing something. Well, no. Adaptability rests in the notion of requisite variety. Requisite variety comes from the field of biology. And it basically says that the organism with the greatest number of responses to any situation is the one that survives. It's not the strongest is the one who can develop the most options. So when we think about adaptability, it's being able to look at whatever is going on in my life and say, in how many different ways can I choose to respond to this? And so it's looking at options. And if you think of it in a, in a business context, I've seen some fascinating pieces of writing that have, that have come across my desk really in the last two weeks where they're saying that the organizations that'll survive are suddenly stepping back and saying, wait a minute, what if we tried it this way? Well, let's look at this that way. How do we engage this? Maybe we're doing stuff right now that we don't need to do and it's consuming the energy of our employees. Let's try something different. And it's not that it has to be dramatically different, but we've, we've actually thought of new ways to do things, which I think is is very powerful but we can also get stuck and we can talk later on if we have time about where we get stuck that we're not being adaptable so adaptability is the first one the second one is agility agility is speed coupled with wisdom so think of this as action so if adaptability is thinking differently and looking at multiple options and figuring out why i'm not looking at multiple options how do i get more input agility says okay you got to do something it's not enough to think. You have to do. And I believe that action is the anecdote for anxiety. And yes, that is my quote. You can quote me on it. When I become anxious, I got to put something in motion. So when I begin to do something, I begin to feel a sense of power coming back. So it's adaptability, agility. The third one, which I think is also incredibly important, is laugh ability. Humor is a great perspective offerer. And so the ability to laugh. And if you think about some of the crazy things we're seeing now that come across, well, people are, are, are having fun with this because it, it tells you what's important. I saw one the other day, just cracked me up. It was a meme and it said, you told me that all I needed to do to go to the grocery store was to have a mask and gloves. Well, you're wrong. Everybody else was wearing clothes. I saw that one too. I think we're following the same person, actually. We're following, yeah, I, the humor is so important. I, You're absolutely I, you right. Know, yeah. I, I love that. And a, a corollary of, of laughability is play. Mm. It's play. Play is a great creative resource. When we play, we become very creative. Watch children at play. And perhaps to find some ways to be adaptable and new ways of responding is we actually can play. So you have adaptability, agility laughability and the fourth one is alignment and alignment is really becoming clear on what i value what is my why uh, in, in fact there's uh, i'm becoming involved in it it's called the why institute that if i lead with my why first then my how and my what can become clear you know frankel said uh, in man's search for meaning that man or woman can survive any what if you have a why. And I, I, when 9-11 uh, occurred here in the States, I was reading accounts of people who had very prestigious positions and you know everything just kind of stopped. And a number of those people were coming back and saying, you know what, this is not important to me. I have a title, I have the money. It doesn't, I don't think it's important enough. I need to find my why. I think it's interesting you mentioned 9-11 um, because of course what we're going through now is also a huge shift for us, You know, something that we didn't p predict or plan and affected a lot of people. And I think it makes you think about your why a lot. It oh. does change it, it changes it. Oh, absolutely. And if you think about the fact that we have so many people now working remotely and what I'm, uh, what I'm hearing now, it's also a source of burnout this working remotely because you know the patterns that we knew were gone and we're now having to juggle everything from you know being a, a homeschooling kids to uh, sharing the kitchen counter with your best beloved you know and it's the, all of those things but what we're also finding out is that people are 
becoming closer to people that they want to become closer to. That the family is actually sitting at the dinner table and, oh my gosh, putting away the smartphone and talking to each other. That they're playing games at night with each other. They are discovering more about each other. Mm. Absolutely. absolutely. And that's a huge positive that's come out of this. And um, going back to your your four resiliency skills, it's lovely that there's very simple to understand and to follow. And I get it. That's really clear. Um, it makes complete and utter sense. But here's a question for you. Does it differ for individuals and for leaders? With the four skills? Mm. How does it differ? How does a leader have to deal with the four skills differently to somebody who perhaps reports to them? Or does it not? Well, let me put it this way. Um, the D. Hawk, the gentleman who founded Visa, mm. you know, one of the things that he was known for saying is, is the first goal of leadership is to lead yourself. So I think number one, a leader can't bring other people along unless he or she looks at what is I'm doing that I'm adaptable. Am I hanging on to legacy systems because, well, I invented them. This is my process. So I think that first and foremost, everyone can develop these skills. The next level is how does a leader then become transparent and provide a model, opening a space for the people who work for her or him to also develop theirs. So it, it will take what my colleague Karen Hurt and David Dye say is how do you create a courageous culture? And a courageous culture is where you allow people to push back, where you encourage voices that are different because that's where you get adaptability. So somebody can say, well, well wait, whoa, 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 stop. Why are we doing this? Is this, is this really important? And so that will take a lot of courage on the part of a leader mm. because it means that the leader acknowledges, I don't have all the answers. Sadly, what we're seeing on a global front is there are people in quote leadership positions in various nations who insist that they, they and only they have all the answers. And mm. we're seeing a lot of trouble because of that. It's interesting, actually, because it, you can look around the globe and you can see the leaders that are really, uh, you know, really connected to their people and what they're going through and those who are totally detached and how yeah. they're reacting under pressure. Those that are able to make decisions under pressure. It's uh, it's it's certainly created a more level playing field in terms of looking at, at leaders and their skills. And uh, we've seen some amazing leaders actually emerge, I think. It, it's it's it really it actually so most of amazing leaders or women what is the name of the woman who's the prime minister of new zealand oh she's fantastic i know oh my, i know oh, names I, can't off the name. I can't think of a name either um, but it's fabulous oh, fabulous okay so so look at what you did and you said something very wise maria you said the leaders are able to make decisions and they make decisions based upon input from people who know more than they do mm. and then they say and therefore in conclusion let's do this I think that it's not leadership if, in fact, someone holds, quote, the title, but refuses to listen to anyone other than his or her own brain. Mm. The world is far too complex to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what do you think then leaders need to do to help teams to not just survive, but to really thrive at the moment? I think, and you said it in my introduction, creating conversations that matter and connections that count. The, the ability to have real conversation. So let's say, for example, that I bring together my team in a, we'll, we'll use Zoom as an example. I bring together my team in a Zoom meeting. I think the first thing that the leader would do is say, I wanna check in. Mm. I wanna know, how are you doing? And I wanna tell you how I'm doing. So we become very transparent. So we, we don't just work on the name, rank, and serial number uh, type of conversation, but we, in, we invite a more intimate look into each other's lives and say, how do we best support each other with what we're going through? And then let's talk about how are we supporting our stakeholders? 
let's let's have that conversation and so i think it is the transparency and the willingness to invite that conversation and that's creating a whole different connection it's also availing to people because there's a there is a lot of depression going on what are the resources that we can make available to my staff you know maybe they maybe they do need to talk to a coach or a counselor or a psychotherapist and we can make that let's and there's nothing wrong with that because we have never been in current times in places like this mm. and it is a global place I, I actually love that sentence um conversations that matter and connections that count i think it's just wonderful it, it just it really resonates for me very strongly very deeply so earlier on when you were talking about the four skills um, of mm -hmm. resilience, um, you said that we might come back to this and I'd like to come back to it. I made a note, I want to come back to it. Where do we get stuck if we're not adaptable? Okay, well, first off, we get stuck in the things that we say to ourselves in our heads. Everything occurs to us in our brains. We don't even, we're not even aware that we're thinking, but we are and because of those thoughts. It controls our, our, what comes out of our mouth. It also controls our actions. And there are two, well, maybe, let me put it this way. I think there are three ways in which we get stuck. One is we get stuck because we are living in the past. It's the way we've always done it. And we, we as human beings, we are so, we, we're such creatures of habit that we don't even know we're creatures of habit. You remember, uh, I, I was... I was, came, I was doing a two-day whatever for whatever organization. And when they came in the second day, everyone went back to the exact same places that they were sitting on day one. And I said, why are you doing that? Well, I mean, well, we, we were used to it. I mean, that's how easy we get. It's, that's, that's, that's my seat. And I'll say, look, how many of you go to church, mosque, synagogue on a regular basis? And hands will raise. And I'll say, how many of you have your place? And most everyone says, it's mine. And if I don't get to sit there, I can't do this. And so there are things that we have to say, does this really make sense, given where we are today? So that's one, is living in the past. The second one, which is just huge, is negativity. And negativity can come in all manner of ways. One is, is this notion of worry. You know, Mark Twain had a saying, he said, I have 103 catastrophes in my life, only two of which actually occurred. <laughs> yeah. so, so we get in this place where we envision all the worst, and then we live there. And that stops us from being adaptable. Uh, and so that's one of the questions we have to say, is this really true? And there's now, scenario planning is smart. There could be five different scenarios. So let's think what they are, what would be our responses to those, and then where do we show up today? So you can do scenario planning, but you say, where is, and that's the other thing, the only place power I have, Maria, is today. Mm. It's the mm. only place I have. What mm. can I do? The third thing um, that can hold us back from being adaptable is the inability to develop what I call intelligent optimism. An intelligent optimism is where you reframe what is happening and you say, you walk around it and say, okay, how can I reframe this so that it, that I can see what's possible versus what is impossible? Um, so let's see, let me give you, let me give you an example of reframing. So in, when we were all we're suddenly brought into lockdown. And so the first response is, oh, no, 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 this is terrible, terrible, terrible. Let me reframe it. What can I now do in lockdown that I couldn't do before? How can I reframe this in a way that I can see where is it that I can take action that I couldn't before? I can't tell you a number of people who told me they finally emptied their garage. <laughs> <laughs> they cleaned out their closet. They did. They're they're learning new skills. They're reading books they had never read before. They are reaching out to people who they know and love, but life got so busy we didn't connect with them. People are having uh, virtual happy hours with friends that they get to see. That was taking an event and saying, "Okay, how can I reframe this in another way?" 
So those are some things that I think can can hold us back from being adaptable. And I have all three of those things. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Hey, Maria, I teach what I need to learn. Oh, very good. I do. I teach what I need to learn. I write what I need to hear myself say and remind myself. You know, we're just, there's so much, there's so much I need to learn and so much I need to remind myself. So every time I get to talk about this, I'm going, listen, Eileen, listen to what you're saying. Mm. And we all know there are people who say the good stuff, but don't live the good stuff. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and it's very important to do both, isn't it? So yeah. I think most people probably will know the answer to this having heard the podcast so far. But I'm going to ask you the question that's probably originally on people's minds. There are a lot of people talking about resilience and resiliency. Yeah. What's different about you, Eileen? Well, I think first of all, you said it, are my four skills. You'll hear people talk about adaptability. Um, you won't hear agility, you won't hear laughability, and you won't hear alignment. So I think the fact that I, that I, in, that I have those four skills makes a difference. Um, so many of the books you pick up on resilience, that's in the title somewhere, or subhead is bounce back. That's what also I think makes me different. And I, I want us to reframe what is a really difficult place as being a place of opportunity. Um, and let me give you an example. And I Eventually, I'm going to have to put this in a speech. But in 1850, there was this massive storm that went across England. Huge, horrible, uh, raged. Uh, massive wind and rain and um, at the end of two days uh, five ships went down all hands aboard there's another Irish passenger ship that went down um, tremendous damage on the little island of Orkney off the coast of Scotland when the storm finally abated I remember 1850 the villagers go out and there is a point of land now called Scarabri I get to roll the R's because I am Irish Scarabri and when the villagers went out, what they saw was this, the topsoil was removed from this point, uh, from the wind, the wind, the waves, the high tide. And they looked down and there was an intact village of houses. It turns out on Scarabri, those houses were older than Stonehenge and older than the pyramids. No one knew they existed. Wow. The disaster revealed what was hidden. I think that what we're going through now has ripped a ton of stuff away. We can't hide anymore. We can't keep pushing stuff down the road and pretending. Now we have an opportunity if we use intelligent optimism. So let's say, how do we now, not new normal, there's no such thing as new normal. How do we create what we want and not cover stuff up again? Wow, that is so powerful. That is so powerful, Eileen. I love that. I love that because I know you talk about the upside of a crisis and this really from what you're saying there, you know, the crisis is, is taking away what was hidden giving us new opportunities it is so wow well, that is really powerful I, I love that story so tell me um because our time has already come to an end isn't that incredible what would you like to leave our listeners with what final thought with regards to resiliency i think what i'd like to leave them with is not my wisdom it's the wisdom of howard zinn who said to have hope, one does not need certainty, only possibility. And that's what I'd like to leave them with, is what is possible. And everyone listening to this podcast has a place of power. And if you choose to use it in ways that benefit those around you, because everyone has a sphere of influence, then maybe we can begin to create the place that we want. Thank you.